Welcome back, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, you're in for a real treat. Fox, a soul animal guide, is here today, and she's going to be sharing all about her gift, her journey towards uncovering it, and how knowing your soul animal can be useful for navigating everyday life. I have witnessed her gift for firsthand, and I am so excited to share this interview. Thanks so much for being here, Fox. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and talk yeah. about this with you today and with everybody else. You know, yes. it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Yes, yes. Well, it's always been so interesting to speak with you since I met you, what, on my birthday, actually, last year, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just think your story is beyond fascinating. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And the first question I ask all of my gifts, what makes you soul driven? Ooh, soul driven. So what drives my soul? I think there's a healthy thirst for knowledge. You know, there's a, a desire to know more about the intricacies of energy and, and the concepts of the universe and spirituality. There's, there's that part. Um, there's also the part that says, you know, I, I feel like I can add something to history in helping people and helping people kind of navigate their own lives and and in turn it gives me something back too so i think what drives my soul in all of that is is the desire to to feel like i have purpose which i think is a very common thing across all kinds of people and and whatnot um also just it's fun <laughs> fun is a good like soul driver um and yeah it, it just it feels rewarding it's it's just a really rewarding thing to, to do what I do and, and to learn more every day because it changes. I think that that's huge for me is that I constantly need some sense of novelty and problem solving in order for like life to feel like it's happening, right? Constant change and transformation is a big part of, of who I am. And I, and I explore that through the soul animal work, through my art, through pretty much everything I do. So yeah, that would be what drives my soul. <laughs> I love that. I feel like we could unpack that and make it its own podcast, right? Because you yeah. <laughs> the love of continued learning in there. Mm -hmm. And then you've got fulfilling a soul purpose, you know, connecting with the fact that there is one for you, wanting to help and give back. Um, and the fact that it's fun, which is so true. It's like, if you're not having fun, you might as well go home, like pack it up, right? Yeah, I think, and you know, there's going to be tougher days than others, I think. And that's with any, any job, any career, any purpose, right? There's going to be days that it challenges you more than others. And, and the concept of fun can be very easily tested, <laughs> right? And you're just like, this is no longer fun. Today is not the fun day. <laughs> but, you know, if you look back at it with the hindsight 2020 thing, right? You realize that it is, it's, it's, it's a, v a very big part. Um, and with a lot of my own personal belief in animism, which is the uh, belief that there's energy that resides in everything, you know, I apply the concept of design and energetic design. And I understand better, like the gift that it is to go through both the hardship and the easy stuff. So if you wrap it all up, it is in a fun bow, you know? <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah, that could be its own podcast today, <laughs> but yeah. we're going to get back on track with the soul animal stuff because, you know, <laughs> soul driven, that's a huge question. And I know that you asked that of everybody, but wow, like it is. what drives your soul? Lots, lots drives my soul. <laughs> it is. It's a huge question. And I think it, what I love about it so much is kind of like I shared with you before we started recording is, is the unique way in which every person answers it, right? Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. First, what I wanted to do is just kind of outline, define a couple of these things for folks so that as we move forward, they feel really comfortable and like they understand. Yeah. Um, my first question is what is a soul animal guide? All right. So 
I guess we'll start with soul animal, the concept of soul animal. So a soul animal is an animal that represents your energy signature, your, your core one. So some people call that a soul. So it's the part of you that exists beyond the physical realm that is the energy that makes you possible. So my gift is being able to see that and therefore I become a soul animal guide for people. I help them and guide them through the concept of the soul animal. And yeah, I mean, you can understand that and, and start to piece together that, that animism, the energy that's at work. And it gives you a, a sense of time, space, and I guess purpose and value too, you know? For sure. Absolutely. So I think that the term most people are used to hearing is spirit animal, right? Yeah, I know yeah. that after seeing you the first time and finding out what my soul animal was when I went home to like do my homework and learn all about it, I was searching for soul animal and didn't really find anything, but there's tons no. on spirit animal. So what is the difference between a spirit animal and soul animal? So for, for many years, because I've been doing this about eight years now, um, I was using spirit animal as the title for what I do, but because I was finding that in multiple practices, the concept of spirit animal was so vast and vague, um, I wanted to redefine it and use soul animal to describe what I was doing specifically. But a spirit animal, um, as, as far as I've come to understand it, is an animal that represents something and can show up as a helper, if you will, on your journey. So I, you know, obviously, like, if you guys haven't figured it out yet, my soul animal is a fox, which is why people call me that. Um, <laughs> but like, there are other animals like Anna's that show up that can be a guide to me. So Anna is a spirit animal guide because of the soul animal that she is. So that's kind of the big difference is that a spirit animal is an animal that shows up in meditations, in, um, you know, commercials, uh, dreams, in person, like if you're in your backyard and there's a raccoon there, like that, that could be considered a spirit animal um, on your journey because it's there to help you. Uh, it doesn't necessarily always align with your soul animal, but it is there to provide aid, I guess, to the whole purpose and, and drive that you're doing. Yeah, that's, I mean, like my understanding of a spirit animal is a guide. And I thought um, maybe you can provide some clarification here that like a spirit animal would be like an animal that is either popping up a whole lot for you mm -hmm. um, or like a random one that's kind of like maybe you're in the middle of a city and all of a sudden you start seeing eagles, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So, it, or in your dreams, I guess. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. That, that's exactly it. You know, um, I believe that the universe is constantly speaking to us through everything that's around us. That's the whole concept of animism. And these animals, when they show up, especially when they show up kind of abruptly or consistently is, I look at it as, as a, uh, an ongoing, like phone call from the universe. Like the universe is trying to tell you like, Hey, like, you've been asking for help, here is something that can help you see what you need to do next to obtain that for yourself. And a lot of times we disregard it, especially if it's something that we see all the time, like for example, squirrels, like a lot of people are like, oh, well, there's squirrels every day, so they can't really be spirit guides because we see them every day. But here's the thing, not everybody on the planet is seeing squirrels, you know, like, <laughs> so take into account that squirrels are in your environment and you are drawn to live in that environment, whether it be through birth or whatever design. And now that animal is a part of that space. So it's already telling you that there's certain things that are at play there. So that's how those animals become spirit guides for you, spirit animal guides. Um, you know, and some people have asked me in the past, like, you know, is what about animal spirits? Now, when we get into that conversation, animal spirits kind of denotes um, animals who've passed on. So like pets or, or that kind of a thing. Um, and people have asked me if that's the realm of, of what I work in. Um, it's not particularly, though it kind of can sometimes 
overlap, but my focus is really to, to come back and work with people with their soul animals so that they can understand themselves and what's at play in their immediate ecosystems. And we can kind of ex expand on that as we go. Yeah. Speaking of squirrels, so squirrels were my first like spirit animals. It was so funny because last, last fall, actually, I have been living in my house for six months and all of a sudden this squirrel was constantly outside of my window and it would like sit on the ledge of my neighbor's like, you know, um, fence and just like chew away and look at me. And it was like, dude, what, like, what, what, what do you want? <laughs> and, um, and I happened to be listening to a podcast one day and she mentioned spirit animal and I was like, Oh my goodness. So I looked it up and it was so dead on. I'm like, squirrels are like hey you're trying to do all the things you're kind of scattered and all over and um mm -hmm. there's more to it but that was absolutely where i was at at that point in time in my life and it was like you know it was showing up to kind of tell me to chill out um yeah. and it was cool because like after i learned about that i think it was maybe like a week or so after i was sitting in bed and i was like trying to do all these things and feeling very anxious. And I looked up and the squirrels were sitting there and I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, and that's key. I think, you know, uh, even if you never find out what your soul animal is, I really feel that it's important that if you're interested in starting to understand the, the quote unquote language of the universe, it starts with being observant to what's mm -hmm. being given to you. And it's not just through those animals, but animals are easier because they stand out, you know, yeah. um, but the, the type of trees that grow in your neighborhood, um, you know, the, the food that's offered to you at a friend's house, like the, the type of colors that you use in your house to paint your wall or whatever, those are all facets of your experience and they're helping you and the universe is offering you a chance to co-create alongside it. And that's, that's a huge part of, of why when I'm working with people, we bring up these concepts because we work from the animal outward, but then help, I help you find ways to, to reconnect, redesign your space to better fit your signature. And that's, right that's kind of how that goes. So yeah, the squirrels, squirrels are an interesting one. And I, could, <laughs> like I said, there are so many different animals on the planet, but squirrels could have their whole own podcast too, because they're a very fascinating group of animals and energetically for people. <laughs> they're, they're huge messengers. So I would not ever disregard them if they're showing up, even if, if they're in your backyard, stealing your bird feed, like pay attention, <laughs> you know? Who are For they sure. the bird feed from? Like what birds come back there and why are the squirrels chasing them away? You know, it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 I call it doing <laughs> life with God. You know, it's like these little things that kind of pop up. Just, I mean, the colors or everybody's like, they go through periods of time where they're looking at their phone and it's always the same number. I mean, there's all kinds yep. of different, different things popping up for us. So spirit animals obviously then can change, you know, constantly. But yes. Soul animals. Do they change? Soul, soul animals in the work that I've been doing. And like I said, I've been doing this eight years. Um, a lot of what I do and I tell people I'm one of the types of, of practitioners out here who has to quantify my woo woo, you know, like if it's going to be like out there, like I need it to, to have some design theoretical base basis to it. Right. So the idea that I'm seeing your energy signature as a very specific animal. It ties into the concepts and physics of energy not being able to be destroyed. It just moves. So if energy doesn't get destroyed or shifted or changed, right, in, in its original state, then, and I see that as a very specific animal, then the theory um, and a large part of like why I practice the way I do is that no, your soul animal won't change. So we can get into so much philosophy <laughs> um, with the concept of time not being linear, but like multidimensional and like, you know, cause then people are asking me, well, what about animals who are extinct or animals uh, that 
you know, are still existing in an energetic form, but not in a physical form? Like, how does that work? And what about an animal species that's relatively new? Like, does that mean that my soul is young? There's so much that can yeah. be explored there. And wow. boy, like I've had all kinds of conversations over the years. So like I said, if we need to do a part two of this <laughs> podcast, we might, we might like explore more of that. But like, yeah, there's, there's so much. But to, in a nutshell, the current status of my practice is no, your soul animal does not change. Okay. So you're stuck with it. <laughs> Which we'll talk about mine a little bit later, but I wish it was a little more cuddly. Oh, well, <laughs> your animal is cuddly. It just depends on how a person is cuddling it, right? Like, maybe <laughs> there is a certain way to handle your animal. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> um, so we're going to transition just a little bit because I definitely want to, now that I feel like we've set a nice like foundation for everyone, what I would love to do is jump into the story. So first, could you kind of share a little bit about your background with us and kind of share, you know, like <laughs> you always have this natural affinity for animals or kind of where that comes from? How far back do you want to go? Um, <laughs> so back in the day. No. Um, so a little bit about me as a quote unquote muggle, right? So I was born and raised overseas. Um, my father worked for the U S government, so we moved around a lot. So I've lived on pretty much every continent except for Antarctica, um, growing up. So I've, I've had a lot of, uh, blessed experience, uh, traveling to different places and learning about different cultures. Uh, in those spaces, uh, I've always loved animals. Um, one of my mom's most uh, fun stories to tell about me is when we lived in Mazatlan when I was little. Um, we lived right on the coast and there are some pretty big iguanas out there, like really, really big ones. And while they are herbivores, um, they do bite. <laughs> well, my mom was in the kitchen and I was like three years old, three or four years old. And she looks outside and she sees me on the ground with my arm down an iguana hole all the way to my shoulder, like leaning in. And she came running out. She's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just trying to say hello to my friends. Cause I would be out there and I'd be talking to all of the animals. I talk to like just little tiny inchworms and the birds. And I've always been like that. Fast forward all of my stuff, right? I went to school for veterinary science and I actually did that for six and a half years. So I've always loved animals. I've always been interested in their behavior. I've been interested in the development of animal species um, through evolution, through all of that science stuff that again, I could get into, but those are <laughs> pathways that way. Um, and then when I left the veterinary field, I, uh, became an artist. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I'm going to just do art. And I did. And my art is what brought me to a metaphysical store here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And it was at that store that I was asked to cover a couple shifts. And then suddenly I found myself working full time out of a metaphysical store with a bunch of psychics. I've always been interested in folklore, mythology. Um, I, I love cultures and I love belief systems and spirituality. So it was, it was a, a, a pretty comfortable space for me to be in. But what I didn't resonate with was all of these people who had very obvious real gifts in intuition. I just didn't feel like I was on par with them. They were seeing people who've passed. They were seeing angels. They were seeing these, these, these images and beings and, and memories of things. And I, I didn't feel like I was on the same level. Um, so uh, one day we got a shipment in of books and those books uh, had a couple of uh, I guess, themes that had to do with animals and how they appear and, and they have symbolism. And as I was unpacking them, one of the psychics I worked with uh, asked me, hey, you, you've worked with animals before. If we were animals, what animals would we be? And I actually thought about it. And I, I thought about it in, in the most logical way possible. And I just started talking about why 
a, each of them in that space would be these animals. And uh, they were like, that's a little oddly specific. They're like, you're going to have to try that with strangers. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not fun. No, I don't do that. And so, yeah, in the beginning, it was these uh, professional psychics and healers who would come out of their room with their clients and they'd be like, hey, she does this cool thing. <laughs> do the thing, do the thing. And I'd be like, <laughs> I'd be like, okay, well, and I would say these things and people were like, that's really like on point. And I was like, really, that's interesting. And so early on, I would sit down with people and I would just kind of practice anybody who came into the space, I would help them find what they were looking for in the store, but also be practicing to see if I could see their animal. And by understanding their animal, I could better guide them to what works for them, right? Like one thing, and I'm sure you've heard me say this a thousand times, what works for an elephant doesn't work for a shark, right? So if somebody's in front of me and they're, you know, um, a, a, Argentinian tegu, right? Like what's going to work for them in the situation that they're trying to deal with their anxiety is a different way that I would treat a horse that's having anxiety, you know, and then that's kind of how it all started. Um, early on, I was, I was kind of almost skeptical. So I would use a lot of cards like um, Oracle cards to validate what I was seeing, but then they started hindering me. Like I would pull a card and it would completely like throw me off to what I was actually getting. So I started more and more trusting it. And the more and more I trusted it, the more it worked, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, and now eight years later, this is what I'm doing. This is, this is the thing. So you kind of mentioned, um, well, first I would think that in regard, because I have sat in on your workshops and because your animals are sp so specific that I would think there's no Oracle deck or card deck out there who, you know, it's gotta be like a deck, like, I don't um, know, yeah, like a couple feet high. Taller than, yeah, taller than most <laughs> buildings with over yeah. 200 million species, not to mention extinct ones, like there'd be a big deck. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you, you kind of mentioned, and I definitely want to touch on this for folks, because I think that for most people, they just assume because they're not seeing dead people or they're not channeling, you know, something directly, um, that they don't have any sort of intuition or psychic gifts. Mm -hmm. So, and you kind of mentioned that, you know, being in this atmosphere with all of these, you know, women who had very obvious kind of gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love for you just to touch on like a little bit more in regards to like how you, like, did you, you know, did you have any kind of intuition or feel like you did before this? And then just kind of how you feel like you grew it. Well, okay. So the concept of intuition on a, on a psychological behavioral standpoint, I think all people have intuition. It's, it's the ability to use both empathy, which gives you a sense of what's going on in your space, like, and what other quote unquote animals are sensing as normal or abnormal in that space to survive, right? So your For intuition sure. is what, what is a part of the survival rate. But if you think about it in terms of like the metaphysical and the paranormal, right? It's a, it's a little bit different. Um, do I believe that everybody's got intuition? Yes, I think everybody does. It's a matter of whether or not you actually want to use it um, regularly in order to paint pictures for how you navigate your day to day. Um, I feel one of the biggest, and this this is, it's again, we, we could have so many offshoots today, but one of the biggest things that holds people back when they're searching for their superpower, their gift, their intu intuitive way is that they constantly feel like it has to fit under the mold of a person prior, right? So I can, I can re-say that in the sense that like, oh, if you meet somebody who's a medium and you're interested in mediumship and you want to develop your own ability to see people who've passed, you go and you take a workshop with this person 
and they're showing you based on how they approach it and their 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 gift but the way that you see and the way that you receive that information from the universe or spirit you know is going to be very unique to you so you cannot confine yourself to somebody else's way and expect to find your your superpower right yeah. and and that was one of the big things early on with my own gift because again like you said earlier soul animals are not you can type in soul animal and you're not going to find very much out there but you type in spirit animal or totem animal and you find so much because those are terms that have been used over a long period of time by multiple people and multiple practices so you can find what i do under those banners but you don't find the specificity of of what i do so like i see animals like you know like I said, the Arch Argentinian tegu, right? Like, so when I see very specific animals, I'm not just seeing lizard. I'm not just seeing duck. I'm not just seeing horse. Like I see very specific ones. And that's what makes it a little bit different. And in order to develop your own practice, your own intuitive gifts, you've got to kind of let go of the anchors that tie to those who are doing it around you. You can get guidance from them, but if you really want to step into your thing, don't hold so much weight in what other people are doing and that's and that's a tough one right because you're like well then how am i supposed to even know well you know it's it's a it's a practice it's a trust it's a self awareness too i always tell people start with like do colors draw you in do crystals draw you in do you like the concept of energy healing how about touch how are you with touch like when you hold an item, do you seem to get things? Like start with the little little basic self-tests to get a sense of what it is that works for you and then go from there. I have a friend who sees energy and understands the the lessons that like trees, like the symbolism behind trees, and she sees energy as trees. And that's something that like the Druid practice does a lot of, but that's the Celtic Druid people we're one group of people in one part of the world and there's so many different types of trees out there you know they didn't have those giant um baobab trees in ireland you know they didn't have those they don't have them there but that tree still holds energetic signature so you you have to explore and go outside of your comfort zone in order to actually find your i guess your innate superpower that i believe everybody actually has otherwise you know, what are we actually like doing with our space? I, I think our superpowers exist in so many different ways. Um, you know, people are like, oh, I'm not as talented as so-and-so, or I'm not as smart, or I'm not as rich. And those are human, human social constructs that can keep us from actually tapping in to some of the and I say this, and I, I'm probably going to get some flack but, but about this, but some of the easiest things out there. Energy is so easy to tap into, but we create the boundaries and the hurdles that keep us from being able to do that because we think that it has to be done X, Y, Z in order to be successful. Yeah. So it's yeah, just, I mean, it's, it's like the, the same thing with, you know, kind of like business. Mm -hmm. um, and when folks are coming to me and trying to figure out what it is that they want to do or like we're trying to nail down um, what their passion is or what the root of what it is that they want to do. I mean, it's all about experimentation and, and having the, uh, the courage to step out and to try things and to try things and just figure out what works for you and figure out what doesn't work for you. And I mean, I, I do think it is good to have like guides, you know, or like someone who can kind of, I always look at it as like learning a foundation. You know, when mm -hmm. I first started salsa dancing, like many moons ago, I took one salsa dancing class because I wanted to learn the basic and yeah. I kind of wanted to get a little foundation, but then I built my dance career off of that. And so it wasn't, you know, I was, I wasn't looking to one person. Um, the, the last podcast that I published, I am my mm -hmm. own guiding light is all about this. 
and very much where our new paradigm has shifted in that we we have everything we need you know like we don't need to go basing our business or our success or our relationships or something like that necessarily on what someone else is doing. Yeah. It's a matter of, of trying a bunch of different things and maybe having some folks along the way who inspire us. And so we pay attention to them, but we don't compare ourselves, you know, because like what may work for them doesn't work for us. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that, you know, Correspond so beautifully, of course, to our gifts because I mean, whether you are choosing like what it what industry you want to go in or what what kind of specialty you want to have, or you're trying to develop your intuition and figuring out what that is, yeah, you know, it, it all comes back to having the courage to be wrong. <laughs> Well, and yeah, and, out, and, that's, you know? and that's scary because we're taught from an early age that wrong means that you failed. And if you failed, you don't get to advance. And if you don't advance, then you lose respect, you lose opportunity. So the, those are big hindrances in, the, in this human psyche. Um, but, you know, it's you, you won't know until you actually do something. Right. So. It's, it's like how we tell little kids or even some adults, right? Like, how do you know you don't like it unless you've tried it? You know, like, it's like, For sure. you know, they're like eat the Brussels sprout, like, you know, For and sure. if you eat the Brussels sprout and you decide you don't like it, that's fine. But now you've eliminated that part and now yeah. you can move on to something else instead of like sitting there at the table wondering whether or not somebody will ever feed you, you know, yeah. like it's, it's that whole thing. So with intuitive practice, intuitive gifts, start with the very basics. Like, what do you like? What are you interested? What are you drawn to? Like if crystals draw you in, all right, start there, get yourself a book on crystals, visit your local metaphysical store, talk to somebody about it and see how they use it and see if that actually sounds like something that you'd be interested in applying to what you do, you know, and, and then you go from there. That's how um, it all starts. I'm, I'm curious to know, like, kind of more about your transition from, you know, reading people who are coming into the store to actually taking clients on and doing, you know, taking money. <gasps> oh, I know. Like that, <laughs> For that your was, service. <laughs> that, that was very difficult for me and is sometimes still very difficult for me, though after understanding the law of attraction, you know, when you hang around metaphysical places and spiritual people, like it starts to like be driven in your head. Like <laughs> everything's a manifestation, everything you speak into being, everything you think you feel, you, you know, you're putting into being. So like, if you are sitting there going, I can't take money. And then you're saying, Hey, my services cost this, like that's negating it's, it's each other. Right. So it became a, I actually was very grateful to have some people in my life who were like, look, everything is about exchange. Um, energy cannot, can exist in a space, but if you move it, right, and you, and you, you take it out of that space, you leave a space open for something else to be there, right? And honestly, what really drove the point home to me was all of the old stories like of of medicine people shamans you know witch doctors witches like the whole idea that there was a person out there who made it their prerogative to learn these ways to help people and in early mankind and in, in, in our history if you wanted something that took that kind of a knowledge that that's specialized knowledge like you had to exchange for it and that exchange was really like what i had to settle in on to get into the mindset to make this a business because i do hear the reasoning behind people who are just like no you shouldn't be doing this for money like i get that but at the same time it does take energy it does take an exchange of sorts, right? And I learned when I didn't take money, when I didn't set my boundaries on the business side of things, not only would business be a lot slower, 
but I would be taken advantage of too, to the point where like it would be three o'clock in the morning and I'd go to the grocery store and there'd be somebody who recognized me. And then it's five o'clock in the morning before I leave the grocery store because I'm talking to them about their animal, their mother's animal, their cousin's animal, and how it's affecting their marriage and what that animal is. And, and, and I suddenly found myself unable to clearly define when my time was available in a business sense and when it wasn't. And I still struggle with that, you know, because I like to talk to people. I like to engage with people. And of, of course, like as, as a person who's constantly seeking knowledge and, and being able to engage with my environment, like it, it's very difficult for me to say <laughs> no, like, cause I'm just like the universe has brought me a gift. Let's play, you know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, people started saying things when I, when I set those prices, the people who would come and invest in, in what I offered, they seem to value it more. They For pay sure. attention more. And the responses I would get are like, you know, this, this has helped me in a way that I was hoping my therapist would help me. And it's helped me see it in a different way. So now I understand what my therapist has been saying, or, you know, now I know better how to communicate with a person who means so much to me. I know now how to better take care of myself, you know, and they've made that investment. And, and that's kind of how I had to see it is in order to get over the hurdle of the money, the business, the marketing side, you, you have to remember that it's a give and take. And if a person out there has that money to help me build my home and like be in my space and pay my bills so that I can keep doing this with the passion and the, the fuel, the soul drive that we were talking about, then that's the exchange. You know, and people have said, well, you know, if, if it's about an exchange, like, would you accept like a bag of potatoes? And I'm going to tell you right now that, yeah, if I needed potatoes, I would, but you know, like it's easier, money's easier because then it's, you're not having to worry about what is needed. Like if somebody comes to my space and says, well, all I have is a bag of potatoes and I don't really need potatoes. I need to pay my bills then that's not going to work. But I'll tell you what, if my bills are paid and I need a bag of potatoes, we can talk, you know, <laughs> like and I, it's, it's what it boils down to is, is it's a conscious exchange. And I know that not everybody has the money, you know, and the money is a big thing. Again, a whole other podcast, right? Like uh, and the hurdles, but it's, it's so important though. And I think it's so important. You and I have talked about this before in regards to like creatives, especially of all kinds. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this like stereotype that because you are, oh my gosh, just pulling this thing out of your head. And of course it's like not really what's happening, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. why are you charging this for that and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of things, but it's, you're absolutely correct in that. Um, People value things that they pay for so much more and the respect that they're going to bring to those appointments that they make with you. And, the, and even the follow through, I would imagine after the appointment, you know, mm -hmm. is going to be so much more affirming in regards to versus someone who's just like, Hey Fox, tell me about this. And then they run out the door because they know they can just come back whenever and ask you the same question. And that's not, I mean, that's not respectful even of your gift. You know, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, running up to a, a, a famous quarterback for the NFL, right. And saying, Hey, I know you're in the middle of your lunch, but I need you to throw a, a football back and forth with me right now. Let's Show do me it. You can throw man, can you, you know, you, like, throw, bro? <laughs> you know, but like, it's, it's, it's like, wait a second. Like, that's not how this works. Like I, I've worked to get here just like you've worked to get here. So let's, let's actually recount how we're approaching this. You know, I've had people come in and early on when I was learning how to set my boundaries, I wasn't doing it in the best possible way. <laughs> like sometimes I would get really like bitey with people because they would come in and just without even saying hello to me, they'd be like, Hey, we heard you do soul animal work. Like what's my animal just out of like 
nowhere and it would be very aggressive and I would get bitey and I'd be like, I don't do circus tricks. Like I don't, that's not what I do. Now I've gotten better about how I respond to things like that because not everybody actually means it in a malicious way, but like it is, it's a matter of respect. Um, yeah. It's a courtesy thing. You don't, you, you can't do that or expect that from anybody. And it's my choice at the end of the day, how I'm using my gift and, and setting that up too, just in the same way. It's, it's your choice, what you're doing with your body, your time, your, your money, like th that's, it. that's how that works. So it's just, um, it's still sometimes difficult for me, but, um, you know, when I first started, I, I had my prices at a certain, certain level and, um, I had business, but it wasn't consistent. The minute that I actually got over the fear and like raised my prices because people said that they'd be willing to pay more, that they were, they, they thought that I was worth more. I started to go, okay, universe, I'm going to take a clue. I'm going to take that hint. And I did it. And I've been getting very consistent business now. And that's scary to do, you know, when, <laughs> when you, when you face that, and I'm sure you know this all too well, but like, yeah, when I did it, I've, I've been very grateful and amazed in a lot of ways <laughs> at the amount of return now that I've, I've done that and I made that leap. So, you know, I, I decided to make some compromises. So I have my workshops, which are more quote unquote affordable, um, you know, and they're in a group setting. So I actually kind of like those better because you get the benefit of like learning other people's animals and how they could be guides for you on your journey here and now. But the benefit of a one-on-one -on -one session is that we can go more in depth and cover some of the topics that are a little more personal, like that you don't want to discuss, like, you know, um, marriage stuff or, you know, family matters or even like parent to, to child type stuff that, that you don't really want to discuss with the whole world and you want to focus more on. So that's, that's the give and take there. And, and that's really, really helped me balance out how I approach my business model too. So. Well, and yeah. I think that that's like the perfect, the perfect balance. You know, I, I see so many people, psychics, mediums, Akashic record readers. And I mean, like they have these fees that are like four or 500 bucks. And it's like, I mean, I, I'm not devaluing them at no. all, you know, but no. it's, it's like they're, and I think it just comes down to like kind of who you want to serve and if you want to be able to serve more people. And so I think having an offering as well, that is like you said, like more quote unquote affordable mm -hmm. enables you to use your gift more to reach more people. I mean, mm -hmm. I would, you know, in, in my own like world, um, especially if I was working in the metaphysical community, A, it would definitely be hard for me coming out of the shoot, like charging, because I'd be like, I want to help everyone. But then it would, I, I know that if my fees started raising, that I would kind of start feeling like I need to give back though. You know, like I have this gift and, and that's not just for like a select few who can afford mm -hmm. it. So I think that having that component, and I, I have seen other folks do that as well, um, like, and I love that when, when they provide those different ways in which to, um, to connect with them and to share their in on their gift. I think that that's, it's, it, it just feels like a more well-rounded practice to me. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it, and it, you know, it's a, it's both self-soothing in a lot of ways but also energetically it it leaves more avenues of connection sure. and and that in itself is i feel very important to living in a space of abundance not just financially but just in abundance in general and and if you choose to accept that you are a part of abundance then being open to offering a wide range that can can help multiple types of people. And you know, what's funny is, you know, early on when I was like, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to have a workshop fee and then I'm going to have a private one-on-one -on -one fee. Right. And I was like, and I get it. Like more people are going to want the workshop stuff. I found that the minute I had that more people opt for the one-on-one -on -one stuff. You know? <laughs> like, and I was like, what just happened? Cause like, you tease them. <laughs> <laughs> they get to know just enough and then they're like oh my gosh like, 
A, well, she's like super legit, and B, like you so want to know more because, like we talked about from the beginning, I went to go online and find things, and like there's you want to know more. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you, that. I, I definitely think you provide you know plenty in the workshop, but I mean. Who doesn't want to know more about themselves, you know, well, and, and you know, find out something un- like that. Yeah. And it's an unfolding process. Like I, I will tell you, you know, um, one thing that people always, uh, tend to ask me is how, how did you know that your animal was a fox? Right. So, um, I didn't, uh, all of the people that I was working with before my, my gift kind of settled in, um, the, the psychics in my readings, would always be bringing up foxes. They'd be like, oh, we see a fox. Oh, we see a fox. And I'd be like, I don't know what that's about because uh, any foxes are cool. Yay, you know? Um, but it took a healing with um, uh, a healer, a local healer here, Sherry Purbe- Purbeck, um, who she was just learning to work with some of the archangels and she wanted to practice a healing on me. So I let her and a lot of stuff happened during that healing, things that I'd never experienced before. And I was like, okay, that's weird. And now I feel like completely like drained, but like in a space, like it was almost like cleaning off a blackboard to the point where it was like black again, instead of like that smudgy white stuff. Right. So, um, the next day when I went home, um, after work, there was a baby fox at the bottom of my steps to my house, like a real one, um, Mm -hmm. not like a ghost one or a spirit one, but like an actual baby fox and everything kind of like flipped for me. And it was at that point that I was like, okay, how can I actually start to accept this? And what is that going to mean for me? And when I started doing that, things just flowed better. Um, uh, I don't know how else to describe it. So I accepted that that was, that was the universe going, now you're ready. Now you're ready to step into this. So like, here you go. And since then I've had all kinds of really fantastical, magical experiences with wild foxes, which side note, PSA, don't go touching wild foxes. Don't try to call them over to you. They do bite. They're not like nice, like creatures they're better to just leave wild yeah. and alone. but I've had some pretty amazing like one-on-one encounters with them um and it's really opened my eyes up to how much I can be doing for myself utilizing the metaphors and symbolism that foxes have in multiple cultures from around the world and and that's helped me redefine how I work with myself. So, you know, it's eight years now and I'm still learning new things about foxes. Like there'll be a a new documentary up on YouTube and I'll watch that and I'll be like, huh, that's something I haven't thought of before, but that actually makes sense to something that's going on in my life. Or I'll come across a document about, you know, how foxes are represented in Korean lore and and spirituality and i'll be like oh that's very interesting because it's not the same as the japanese or the algonquin or you know and and it is just it helps me realign and and remind myself what track i'm actually on and for what reason and that's kind of how it works for for everybody else that i read and i work with is that you know for your animal you could you could read all you want and and watch documentaries and then one day like there'll be a post on instagram and you're like hey that's my animal you'll read it and you'll be like oh my gosh that applies to me you know and and that might be years down the ro- the road And it's there to help you. It's there to remind you who you are on an energetic level. There isn't an animal separate from you. It's an animal that represents you. And it's not like it's actually there. It's not like, you know, you are an animal. Because some people ask me that. They're like, are you saying that like at the root of who I am, I'm an animal? No, at the root of who you are, you're an energy signature. But that to me, my gift sees that energy signature as a very specific animal. And so you can utilize that as a basis of designing uh, a map for you to use in this lifetime. So that's kind of how that works. So I'd love to, I'd love to transition into like some practical uses for people, um, some examples and things like that. Um, you have already kind of shared with us, you know, your 
uh, soul animal and kind of how it relates to you or things that you're utilizing within your own life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it would be cool just to kind of, well, so my soul animal, thanks to Fox, I know (laughs) is a black king. Well, is a king cobra. I guess you didn't say black. Um, which is why I wish it was more cuddly. <laughs> oh no. So, okay. Cause it's Snakes. not, but yeah, I would love for you to kind of, you know, just like share and utilize that maybe as an example. Um, you know, like what it is that I'm, I do in regards to having a marketing agency and you also mm-hmm. know kind of um, the transition that's going on in my life. And I will certainly share that, that Fox was like, one of the first people to just like call me out <laughs> um, when I went to her workshop and it, was in, it was in the best possible way I mean she literally it was like she everything was quiet and she said have you started your healing yet not for yourself for other people and I was like what <laughs> Anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking a little bit no, here. No, no, you're good. You're good. I, I enjoy, like, every time I talk to people about, like, their experience, I'm like, I, I enjoy hearing how they receive what I was offering. Because, you know, sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I actually, like, touched on anything. And then they come back and they tell me, and I'm like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> like, it worked for them. But yes. Yeah, so um, we'll we'll start with the first thing. So in by understanding your animal, and in your case as being a king cobra, right, you can start to piece together um, your love language is a big one. And that's one of the biggest things that people utilize their animals for is how to communicate better, right? How can I let people know that this is actually really making my hood flare up? Like this is really like making me uncomfortable to the point where I feel like I have to stand my ground and stop everything that I'm doing. Or how can I communicate that I want to be held more? Or how can I communicate that I, I require peace and quiet while I actually solve like home issues and how can I let people know that that demand or that need for that peace and quiet is actually um, not an indication of me being upset or aggravated with people. It's just how I function, you know, just little things like that can help people start to to redefine and redesign how they're actually saying things to others because like I said earlier what works for a shark doesn't work for an elephant and in your particular homestead you know what works for a king cobra doesn't work for a secretary bird right (laughs) so so like um you know you've got to you've got to like start there with your love language and love language doesn't mean like just romance. It's, it's everything. Like, why are you putting in that energy into anything that you're doing? And that's with work, uh, people, family, whatever. Like it's, it's, it's that part. The next part too, is it might even have to do with your physical space, right? So sometimes we, um, put ourselves in places that are uncomfortable because we hope that if we're there long enough, it'll change to suit us. And that's not always the case. So like when I talk to people about their animals and, um, you know, how to better design their space to, to make them feel better, sometimes they need uh, smaller spaces, right? Like certain animals that tunnel need a lot more comfort and confinement and, even sometimes darker spaces in order to feel safe. Whereas in a human construct, in a social construct, the bigger the house, the more money you have, the more respect you've earned. But those animals don't thrive in that kind of a space. So by understanding your animal and all of the ins and outs, and you had said earlier, the strengths and weaknesses, right? So I don't think that animals really have weaknesses they may have things that don't work for them (laughs) um and that might seem like a weakness through the eyes of a human but in the animal kingdom it is a part of the design for the balanced ecosystem which is what we want right energetically we want balanced ecosystem so we need just as much predators to fit into a space with just as much prey in order there there to be enough to go around for everybody so your your microphone just like oh no hold on <laughs> is it 
Is that better? No. No? I don't know what happened. Nothing happened on my end. Do you have headphones in? I don't. No? No. Oh, no. It sounds like you're, like, in a tube. Oh, no. That's not good. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Hold on. Let's see. Is that any better? No. <laughs> Okay, hold on, hold on. How about now? Oh no! I know! I was, I'm not in a tube! <laughs> I'm not in a tube! I didn't do any, like, nothing happened on my end over here that changed. I don't know what happened. Oh man, okay. Well, it was so funny because the, at the beginning of this call, I'm thinking like, this is awesome. I'm finally getting the audio down for my interviews. <laughs> <laughs> no, the universe is like, but have you really? Um, <laughs> but have you really? Okay, well, that's, that's all right. We can, we can work with it. Okay. Um, oh, wait, I think you came back. Oh, yeah. And you actually, what was interesting just then when you were like, um, it like did a weird like sound thing and then it went back into space. So maybe, I don't know if it was on your end or not. Yeah, who knows? We'll keep okay. it. <laughs> okay, yes, we're back. We're back and live. Um, so, okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, understanding your animal and applying it in those ways can really help you. So let's, guess, let me ask you, yeah. I guess, some like specific questions because I know sure. that like this is such an expansive subject. It but, is. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, I am a king cobra, and yeah. my boyfriend is a secretary bird, which, folks, I mean, when we, when we learned this in the workshop, it was hilarious, because <laughs> if you don't know what a secretary bird is, which I didn't before this, they kill snakes. They literally, like, stomp on snakes and eat them, and that's, like, what they do. They just, like, beat them into the ground, and they're, like, these tall like four foot whatever like beautiful birds that like prance around so <laughs> this is totally my boyfriend first of all <laughs> um but let's just kind of talk about so like within the confines of our relationship i'm obviously a snake he's obviously a bird so like what are some of the things that we should um be aware of well, first of all, like, I always encourage people to get to the root of what their own animal represents. So when you are drawn to a specific space, it's because your animal is being energetically called to that space. That's the law of attraction, right? Because there are other animals in that space who need you. And in turn, they're drawn to those spaces because you're coming to that space too. So there's a, a slow movement in and, and a convergence already energetically. So if you start to understand what your animal represents, you'll know why certain types of people seem to linger or consistently show up in a pattern, right? And in the case of a king cobra, all snakes are going to represent a form of deep healing by letting go in order to grow. Um, especially the venomous snakes, right? There's the, the, the anti-venom exists within the venom, right? So like there's those concepts and themes that are already going to be a big part of your life as a cobra who will, you know, stand the ground and pop the hood and make itself look bigger, right? And, and do a lot of perspective work. You're going to draw in the types of people who need to shift perspective and learn how to put boundaries up so that they can heal, so that they can work through that letting go to grow process. So there's that part there. With a secretary bird, there's a lot of perception from a different angle, right? A way to help people stomp out, right? That, that stomping of snakes, right? To stomp out the things that hold them back from healing, right? So um, the fear of, of what happens if I actually do live my best life, right? So he's going to draw in the types of people who are like on that precipice, on the edge of stepping into what would be best for them to heal to grow so he draws that in and when a person's like sitting there willy-nilly not making a decision he energetically wants to stomp that out and say no 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 like get back on course with it um so 
both of you being drawn together <laughs> and we've talked about this, right? There's a balancing act there. Like he's challenging you to be a King Cobra. He's challenging you to learn how to pop that hood and be okay with the consequence of what happens next. Because King Cobras are not some tiny little snake that's not going to make a, a difference, you know, when it stands its ground. And in turn, he can handle that. So you help him realize that he is meant to be able to tackle those kinds of things. Um, so you can learn how to better balance each other out through your communication style by remembering what you each represent to each other. So this can be applied to any types of animals, right? So like just you and I right now, as a fox energy, when I show up, I represent seeing things as they are, not how you expect them to be. So everybody who's watching right now and is engaging with the concept of a king cobra and the concept of a fox is benefiting in this moment from what we represent. So all of you out there in YouTube land and in, in, in the, the radio land, right? Like, let go to grow start seeing things as they are instead of the way that you're expecting them to be because you think that that's going to actually like come around and like turn into what you want it you know to be like make it so that you are present you are aware and then maybe you can start to let go and grow from from those spaces and that's what we represent so it's so are there dying. animals oh. that sorry um are there animals that like can never get along or like should never be together or yeah and I mean that's that ties into you guys too right so here's an animal that like kills snakes and eats them. <laughs> and then here's a snake who's just I like, like a challenge no. you know like there's <laughs> there's a challenge and people ask me this all the time so what's the best animal for me well the reality is is as a human being which we are having human experiences you can make it work with anybody but it's a matter of what you're going to allow you know like I, I like people. I do. And I enjoy meeting all kinds of new people, but I'm not going to always be tolerant of certain types of behavior in my space, my personal space. Like it's one thing to be out at a grocery store and listen to somebody who's berating another person and then stand my ground to them. But to live with that same person who's being, you know, condescending that's a whole other ball game, right? Like you can stand your ground in the moment, but consistently that's not going to work. And it doesn't have to do with the animal at that point. It has to do with how that person is navigating, how they're actually driving their meat wagon, you know, like that's, that's just how that is. Um, there are certain types of animals that would be better suited. For example, if you're a partner animal, having an animal that understands what that means and what kind of energy needs to be put into a relationship in order for there to be balanced that way is going to be more beneficial. Having animals that understand hierarchy and purpose and job in a relationship that you really rely heavily on having those things set better for you. It's not going to be as always that easy with an animal who's very independent, who doesn't like cuddles, who doesn't want like, you know, you up in their space all the time. You're going to have to like be okay with some distance with some animals. So again, it boils down to what you're actually willing to tolerate, what you're willing to allow. And it's not about compromise. It's about allowance and respect. You know, you can, people are scared of snakes because of the venom, right? Oh, it's going to bite me. It doesn't have any facial expressions. I don't know what it's doing. It's going to come after me. This animal is not a nice cuddly animal. But then you talk to people who work with snakes and they love them and they respect them. And if you watch them handle some of the world's most venomous snakes, these snakes are not hurting them. And it's because they respect them. They know who they're working with. They see them and give them the room for them to be. And it's the same thing. We as human beings can do that for each other. But again, we're taught from early ages that that's not always how it works, right? We think that, oh, if I'm nice to this person, if I, you know, give them time, if I give them an allowance into my space, I'll get what I want but that's not how it works. You can't just invite an animal like a tiger in your, into your home and be like, cool, now I get to say I live with a tiger and then deny the tiger meat. 
because that tiger needs meat, you know, and you're just asking for the tiger to start wondering whether or not you're on the menu, you know, and then that's where the conflict and friction can happen in any kind of relationship. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do you see, how do you see people, um, being affected? Like, you know, how do you see people that I'll start over? (laughs) How do you see people utilizing this information in their lives? Like it, does it give them more confidence and more strength? And, and those kinds of things. It's definitely meant to be an empowerment thing. Um, not everybody feels empowered when they find out they're an animal like a mouse or an earthworm or um, a rat, right? Like not everybody feels that way. And I've met people who really struggled when I'm like, this is what your energy signature is. And some people have fought me tooth and nail. Um, <laughs> sure. to, to, to be like, no, that's not me. And, and then that's fine. My, my job and what I've had to kind of step into in my personal practices and in, in what I offer to people is to let go of that part, right? So when I told you you're a King Cobra, there were, there were options there for you. And you could have been angry at me saying, no, that's not who I am. You could have been like, you know what? Like that was a waste of my time. Or you could have been like, you know what? I'm going to go research this before I actually make an opinion. Or you could be like, yes, that's me. That sounds like me. You know, at that point, that's up to you. I've done my part as the guide, right? Like I, you have booked your adventure in the English countryside. I brought my lantern. I took you (laughs) through the moors. I showed you the sites. I was like, there's Stonehenge. It's up to you to actually look at it. It's up to you to make the memories. It's up to you to utilize what you've learned on the journey. And I've, that was a big thing that I had to get okay with, right? So after you've learned your animal, my biggest recommendation is to go and research the biology, the actual like, hey, this is the real animal and this is how they live. And then see if you can't find symbolism through different cultures, through different um, practices, whether they be shamanic or Native American medicine work or whatever, and really come to understand how people have seen this animal, how it reacts with other animals, what its role is in the ecosystem, and you can start to really better understand where you sit in all of that because it's 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 metaphorical in a lot of ways and that's how you apply it to what you do so again it's meant to be empowering but if you're finding that you're struggling with what your animal is your soul animal is then my biggest question to those people who struggle with that is what's wrong with it and if you can answer that truthfully you'll start to realize that maybe your biggest issues with that animal are at the root of some of the biggest issues you have with yourself. For example, that animal's ugly. What is ugly? Why is that at the forefront of your thoughts? That animal is one that people don't like. It's not cuddly enough. It's not, it's, it's, (laughs) it's, it's venomous. Like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean that there's going to be a, 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 a divide between me and everybody forever and ever because that's what I am. I mean, I know somebody who's a Nile crocodile. Those animals are not, you know, animals to be messed with. <laughs> and she knows it. She knows that that's who she is. And she, hearing that information, she told me, she was like, it made so much more sense that people wanted to approach her and they expected to try and tame her and she wasn't that energy. And she was yeah. okay with that. Yeah. You know, the people who deserve to be in a water with a Nile crocodile are the ones who respect that that's a Nile crocodile, just right. like Steve Irwin, right? Like he knew his crocodiles because he knows them. He's made time to know them and he's given them the space to be that. So that's, that's the thing. You want to make it work with others around you and within yourself, you got to come to terms with that. It's good wisdom. I feel like it can be applied to anything in life, right? I mean, <laughs> like, like people share information with you. They share feedback with you. You can do what you want with it from that point mm-hmm. in time. Um, so I want to go ahead and wrap things up. I feel okay. like we could just keep talking for days. We probably could. <laughs> um, <laughs> And we'll have to talk about like what we could do for part two, because that would be fun. 
Um, but I have a round of closeout questions for you. Okay. Listening round. You ready? I, I'm going to try to be as quick and as concise as I can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number one, what is the one habit that you can't live without? Oh my God, one habit I can't live without. One, oh my God. And this is a lightning round. Hold on. Um, <laughs> the one habit I can't live without. Oh, that's so tough. Um, oh. Is art a habit? <laughs> Like creating is creation. Yeah, yeah. Creativity. Okay, so creation. Yeah. Being able to be creative, I think, is a habit I could not live without. Good. Yeah, that's a great answer, I think. Okay. Um, number two, what does spirituality mean for you? Mm. Well, it ties into that soul drive, right? So um having purpose, uh, understanding, connection. There's a lot of connection stuff that happens when I delve into spirituality for me. It's about understanding the interconnectivity of everything and how I'm a part of that and how I get to be a part of that. One of my things is, is there are some types of people out there who look at the stars and go, how, how small am I? Like, wow, I'm so small and insignificant. And I look at the stars and I try to remind myself that how special do I get to be because I'm a part of all of that. You know, and so that's kind of spirituality for me. It's an interconnectivity. I love it. Okay. Um, number three, what is your advice to anyone who is looking to find their purpose? <sighs> Remain flexible. Um, you know, like <laughs> you are one of the many pieces out there and you're here because you are here. And if you try to be somebody that's not you, then you're not aligning to that. So if you want to find your purpose, start with really trying to get to know you and realize that you don't have to be anybody else that's why you're here in the first place so yeah remain flexible be ready to adapt learn grow transform and repeat <laughs> i like it it's like very mr miyagi i feel like <laughs> wax on wax on <laughs> okay um so final uh, where can people connect with you online? And also in this question, I would love for you to share like what your offerings are for folks. Sure. Okay. So I offer private one-on-one -on -one sessions and because we're in a time where like in-person type stuff's not available, I'm doing that. Um, it's up to you through Skype, phone call, or through Zoom. Um, and I, those are an hour long and $130. And I also have been doing a Facebook live event twice a month. Um, I might increase that for the next month. Um, but if you head over to my Facebook page, um, it's at the Fox Lantern, all one word, and that's how you'll find it. And the page title is the Fox, or you can find me on Instagram at the Fox Lantern. Um, and the, the Facebook live events are like my workshop. So you can either watch for free or if you're interested in learning your animal, you can get up with me via email or private message um, to sign up for that, that service. And I've posted my past one, so if you guys wanted to kind of see how that works, it's there for you. But my email is foxlantern at yahoo.com. And yeah, you can just kind of hit me up in any of those places and see what I'm up to. And I'm a very eclectic type person, and I just kind of like follow my own whimsical way. But if you guys have questions, find me that way. <laughs> awesome. And I'll make sure to include all of these links in the show notes. So awesome. no worries. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Miss Bach. Oh, <laughs> of course, Miss Cobra. I am very happy to be here and to talk to you and everybody else out there. I mean, this is, this is the fun stuff. I'm so glad that we live in a time and day where we have this 
to be able to do from just about everywhere in the world. And that's my next step just, you know, I'm putting out there manifesting is that after all of this is done, I plan to take this on the road so that I can go meet more people. Um, so that's, that's the next step. So maybe one of these days soon, I'll be coming to a town near you. <laughs> be awesome. Which would yeah. Be awesome. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to hear from you. What do you think your spirit animal is? Your soul animal. <laughs> Find me on Instagram at Anna Hendricks and share on the post for today's episode. Use the hashtag soul driven podcast or send me an email at soul driven podcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. If today's message was fun or helpful for you, please be sure to share it with those you love and leave me an iTunes review. Don't forget to sign up for the email list. Workshops, worksheets, and other helpful tools will only be shared with that community. All links from today's show will be in the show notes. Be safe and stay well. Until next time.